Our next speaker has been involved in Linux uh, kernel development with networking for quite some time. Uh, he used to work more directly on NIC-based stuff, but now he's been concentrating on BPF and Cilium and compiler technology and stuff like that. Um, and today he's going to talk to us about transparent encryption using BPF and Cilium, and I'm really looking forward to this presentation. So please give John a warm welcome. Okay, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about seamless transparent encryption with BPF and Cilium and um, have a quick agenda here. So first, we'll just talk about like what I mean by the, that phrase. So what, why do we want transparent encryption? What is it? And then a brief um, Cilium Kubernetes uh, overview, um, just barely enough that um, we can explain the rest of the pieces and um, how this works in Cilium. Um, Cilium actually has two options. We can do L3 encryption or L7 encryption. Um, for L3, we use IPsec, so we'll go through that. Um, and for L7, we have MTLS. And so another interesting piece here to look at is, so L3 is part of Cilium today. You can go to Cilium and, and download the product and deploy it. And L7 is also part of Cilium. So we'll kind of, as we go through, I'll try to highlight what is released and in production now, what is a prototype, and then what is even further out, which is you know, stuff that exists in, in my systems that I'm working on and hacking on and hoping to have working you know, in the next handful of months. So, so what is transparent? What do we mean by transparent? So first off, tr we want to make sure that we don't trust um, applications. So because we are the agent running around with a bunch of pods, we don't necessarily trust the pods themselves to do encryption. So it's not good enough to just say, um, pod, please do some encryption, because we don't necessarily control that pod. And even, um, even more to the point, it's not really feasible to add encryption to every application. So we want it to be transparent. So you turn it on, and then everything in the node is encrypted. Um, the next piece is it needs to be sort of usable. So you can't um, expect, and this will be on the next slide about the scale and how things are dynamic, but we can't expect users every time a new node comes online to do some sort of action to make this happen. Um, and the next piece and is it, we want it to be auditable so that you can um, verify that encryption is actually working. And if encryption for some reason stops working, that you have like a, a hard break. So you can cut off the traffic, block it, drop it. Um, make sure that you don't put data on the wire that's not encrypted. So for, to start with, we do this, I do this inside Cilium. Um, Cilium is a CNI that works with Kubernetes or Docker. It leverages BPF for all of its policies. Um, and in this case, if you were here earlier, we talked a bit about um, Cilium earlier. But in this talk, we're going to talk primarily about the transparent encryption, not about the policy or um, how we do load balancing and various other things. Here's a quick picture. Um, so on every worker node, which is just a, a node inside your cluster, we run the Cilium agent. Um, in Kubernetes environments, there's a set of pods. Each one of those pods has a VETH device or a IP VLAN device into the host um, networking space. We run BPF programs on ingress and egress of each one of those pods where we can apply policy. And in this context, one of the policies is going to be encryption. And then eventually there's a routing table and you can go out on the network. Um, there's also a, a tunnel mode where we support VXLAN and Geneve, and there's a few other modes that we'll mention, but the primary, uh, uh, most of the description in this talk will refer to the sort of native routing mode where you use the host networking's routing table. So why is this uh, interesting at all? Um, and, and sort of why is it different than doing like a VPN, a point-to-point -point VPN with IPsec? So first of all, because it's a Kubernetes environment, everything is more or less dynamic. So clusters can be added and deleted on the fly. Nodes come and go, pods come and go. As we saw earlier, services can be added and removed, you know, thousands of them at a time. And we also have policies that are applied dynamically. And while all this is happening, we need to ensure that there are no packets on the wire that are not um, encrypted. And um, the other problem is, it's not only is it dynamic, but we have to deal with these sort of larger scales. Um, so Cilium, for example, we, there was a blog post and they talked about you know, 5,000 nodes, 100,000 pods, thousands of services. So at this scale, we need to make sure that everything is efficient as well. So this is a brief um, sort of overview of the, what we're going to talk about. So at the L3 encryption layer, we use IPsec, um, and that's been available in Cilium 
version 1.4 had a, like an initial release, 1.5 was better. The recent um, 1.6 release has even more features that we support. Um, on MTLS, uh, we've been supporting Istio and Envoy for quite a, Envoy for quite a while. 1.4 has a few of these things we'll talk about, uh, and KTLS is, is scheduled for probably the next release. So we can, as we go through, I'll just sort of reference this. And, and the point I'm trying to make here is that some of this is actually real and deployed, and then some of the pieces are prototype work that's going on, so we'll call that out as we go. So primer on IPsec. There's two modes. You can run in transport mode and tunnel mode. The difference is basically one puts an IP, an IP header on the top, and one um, does not. Um, for our case, we can actually support both. Uh, we'll talk a lot about, it. usually this decision has to do with um, your routing tables. So you, one advantage you get in doing tunnels is if you had thousands of pods that all have IPs. Um, if you do tunnel, now you have an IP per node, so your routing tables may scale slightly better. Um, on the other hand, you may not want the extra overhead of a tunnel, in which case you can use transport mode. So that's the um, sort of basic modes. Uh, if we look at the actual packets of these, this is the sort of condensed version of what it looks like. On the top, you have just an original packet that we would get in Cilium with a payload, a TCP, maybe some IP options, and maybe an IP header. We then tack on an encapsulating security payload, ESP. Um, this is the IPsec part. Um, it contains a lot of um, some IDs for your encryption and so on. Uh, and then you also tack on a trailer and some authentication. If you're doing in tunnel mode, then you have um, the ESP on the outside of the IP header and you encapsulate the inner IP header. So um, from a security point of view, one, you're encapsulating your IP headers and all your IP options. And on the other one, your um, IP options and stuff will be in plain text. So that's a, a kind of a decision you need to make when you're deploying this. Um, so how does this deployed in Linux? Um, I don't know, how many people have used um, IPsec in Linux? Do we have it, we got a handful, quite a few people actually, so this is good. Um, so you have the policy piece, which tells you how you want, what you would like to encrypt. So here's an example with a source and a dust IP, a direction, priority, and a mark field. So the mark field's important for us because we'll use the mark field pretty heavily. And then you have a state, which gives you sort of the encryption state, the keys that you're going to use um, for that encryption context. Um, and this is a sort of an eye chart, but the one thing that I want to just take away is that I, um, IPsec is happening kind of above the routing tables here. And so what that means is when you're trying to deploy into a customer um, data center, you also have to be aware of all the routes that are in the system and how that is being managed. All right, so that is IPsec in four slides. All good. <laughs> There's only, you know, 50 or so RFCs to cover this, so if you want, we can do that later in the hallway. That's the hallway track. Um, okay, so how does L3 encryption work in Cilium? So we'll start with the control plane, and then we'll go to the data path. Uh, the, on the control plane side, uh, basically you get a Kubernetes event, so either a node's been added or a pod's been added to the cluster. And that event is handled by our Cilium agent that is running on all the nodes in the cluster. The, we get a, that calls into some node updating logic that will update some of the Cilium IP cache that then f causes you to add a route for IPsec and eventually update the IPsec stack. Once that has all been done, this is what we get. So on the far left, we have a BPF map that is populated with all the IP addresses on the node. Um, inside that, the key here, which is three, is a reference to the IPsec key actually in the um, data path. And the reason we, we have this is because we need to support multiple keys at any given time. And that's important because if you only support a single key, you have no way to do uh, a rolling update, for example. Um, when you're deploying the, a Kubernetes environment and you have 5,000 <laughs> nodes, you can't update all of your nodes at the same time. So if you were to, when you turn on IPsec, they don't all know that they're doing IPsec instantaneously. There's some, some time that this rollout happens. And you don't want to lose connection during this rollout phase. And then the next time that this becomes very important is when you want to update your keys. So at any given time, there could be many IP addresses in this table, and they'll each have their own key ID. And um, they may not all be the same. So when we do a lookup on the data path, which we'll talk about later, this is how we know what key to send out. Um, next, because we're using the routing table, we need to add some routes uh, into the routing table, and we point them at Cilium Host. And Cilium Host is a, um, 
is the network device associated with Cilium, where we run our policy. And what we'll see here is that when this IP address is sent, it will be then routed to Cilium host, when we have to be careful about MTUs here because we're gonna add a tunnel header in this specific case. Um, and this is a bit tricky because you need to make sure you get all the MTUs correct, or else you'll have a packet that's larger than the MTU out and um, it'll be dropped. And finally, we then add the state into the um, IPsec state table. And again, you'll see the couple pieces here. We have a, a mark value. The mark value will be set by the data path. And the reason we want to do this is because we want to make sure that we are isolating our configuration from the rest of the system. Meaning, if some other configuration exists in the system that we're not aware of, because Cilium agent is coexisting with another, um, possibly another um, control plane, uh, we want to make sure that we don't collide. Um, and for that mode, this happened on the previous mode, what we were showing is that every time there's an update, we're adding an entry to the IP cache and setting up the rules. There's also another mode that some customers use that I'll just mention briefly, where they know sort of a priori of all the um, subnets they're gonna have, and we can set that up at initialization time. So the distinction is, um, Cilium, when it's running, doesn't always know that all the IP addresses that are gonna be used in the network, so we have to sort of do it dynamically. But if you're in a situation where you can, you know all the IP addresses up front, you can do sort of the setup at the beginning. Um, this has some, some cons and some pros. So the, the, the advantage of doing this is instead of dynamically on every pod add and every node add setting up new encryption rules, you can do them all up front at init time. Um, the downside is then you have to know all your IP addresses that are gonna be used at init time. And you can, or you can combine the two if you want and use I know this subnet will come online at some point, but there may be a few other IP addresses that uh, come online later, in which case we will set up the ones that we know about at init time, and then as the system evolves, we'll add the other ones that aren't in there. So kind of a combination of the two. Okay, so that was just setting up the data path, and the, the next sort of obvious question is how do we get the keys in Kubernetes? So um, in this case, we need every node to have the key, or if we have multiple keys, they need to have all the keys that um, they need to decode or decrypt. Um, and in Kubernetes, there's something known as a secret. And the secret is um, something that all the nodes will learn, it will be encrypted on the disk, and they'll have a way to read it. And so the, the sort of basic way you can do this with um, Cilium is you can create a new secret, you then mount the secret into the agent, and the agent can read the key. And this um, is sort of the most common way that we see today. Um, it, and we also support rolling updates, so you can do a restart um, with a new key, and the new key will be pulled in. Uh, there's a feature out to pull in the keys automatically, so if you just update your secret, then all of your agents will kind of, that secret will be propagated through the cluster, and then all the keys will be updated. And the two key pieces here is we want to make sure that we do this without ever dropping any traffic. So we want to make sure that um, we don't, say, for example, encrypt with want the wrong key to a node that doesn't know the key yet. Um, and also, we don't want to do, probably the worst case would be to send traffic that's not encrypted when we believe it is encrypted. So then there's another, um, another option here. Um, so that's the sort of shared key method. Then we have SPIFI, um, which stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. So this is a... Basically, they have an X509 certificate, uh, and they have um, a way to deploy this. Um, the runtime environment for this is called Spire, which is spiffy runtime environment. And if you want to, like, uh, there's a handful of specs that go along with these. So the important thing to know from, from Cilium standpoint is this piece will manage the key signing and certification. So like, if you are an agent running, you can request a key pair, um, from the Spire agent, and the Spire agent will then validate that you as the requester are, um, are, the, are a trusted um, agent. And it will do that, there's a couple ways it can do that. It can check like, uh, it can do a hash over the binary and see if that binary is known in its database and then give you the proper key. Um, you can do it based on some other, um, other methods as well. And here's a quick picture. So uh, in this case, 
basically that I talked about the Spire agent that ran on the node. There's also a Spire server that that's what does the key authentication. And you can integrate with a CA that you own, or you can do it on your, um, or you can do sort of a self-signing um, bootstrapping process. And then, um, basically, the other piece of this is that you can open up a, like a, um, a Unix socket and you can listen for events. And so this allows you to do sort of dynamic updates of your keys without somehow kicking the agent itself. So it, it'll listen, and then if the Spire agent rotates your key, for example, you'll get an event. You'll then take that key, apply it to the tables that we saw previously, and update your um, IPsec data path, and everything should keep working. And I already mentioned this. The other piece of this is that then the Cilium agent is the piece that inter interfaces with Spire agent. So. All right, so that's the control plane um, using shared keys or spiffy. So let's talk about this. This is a picture here showing a pod with a VETH pair um, on the left with a BPF program, which is the BPF program runs on every packet that is leaving the pod. And that BPF program is generated by Cilium agent. What we do when we see this, um, when we see a packet leave the pod is we run our policy engine inside a Cilium agent that's being run by this BPF program. And the key piece that we look up is that IP cache from before that we populated, and we look and see if there's a key in there. And that key ID will tell us uh, how to mark the packet so the data path can do the encryption. So we mark it with a E00 code, which means encrypt. And then, I don't show it here, but there's a, the bytes above the E actually specify the key. So in our example, we had three, it would be three E00. So we have a key space where we can identify the key. We then, what Cilium would normally do is then redirect that traffic to um, either the routing table to egress the system or to another, um, another virtual device if it's a local pod. But in this case, because we want to hit the encryption stack, we can't do the redirect because a redirect from BPF would bypass um, IPsec. So what we do is we pass it up the stack where it get, actually gets encrypted via a route from the routing table. After the encryption, we then route it back to Cilium Agent because we need to get back to Cilium Agent to tell us what, uh, where to redirect this packet. Once it's on the Cilium Agent, at which point you can um, do the redirect to, ETH, in this case, ETH0, but it's possible you might have multiple interfaces um, outbound. And the complication here is that this case shows pod to pod, but we really have pod to node, pod to host networking. And they're all slightly different in the details of how they're done, um, which complicates the implementation slightly. Uh, so if we just walk through, which I, I just did, there's a lookup key in the IP cache, mark it with the key, do the encryption. And I show on the, on the right here the, the key number with the mark value that we were talking about. Um, there's one sort of subtle issue here. Um, if you're using the, the subnet mode that we talked about earlier where you set it up before, generally you don't know what nodes have what IP addresses. So because you, you know ahead of time your subnet of IPs that are going to be allocate, allocated from, but you don't know exactly what node those IPs are going to be assigned to. However, when they are assigned, the data path will get an event and know where the IP to node mapping is. So what we do to sort of reduce the IPsec data path um, rules is we do the encryption, which will put, if it's in tunnel mode, we'll actually put another IP on the outer header. And then we rewrite that destination IP from the BPF data path. On this way, we don't have to have a rule per node in the, in the IPsec table. We only have a rule uh, per subnet. So if we're concerned about scaling, what happens is we're now able to scale with the, the subnet IP ranges and not with the number of nodes, or worse, number of pods. Um, the last piece that is a bit tricky here um, is we have to do a FIB lookup and a MAC rewrite and a redirect in the BPF program to figure out where to send this packet. And the, the reason we have to do the MAC rewrite is because we didn't send it out the normal stack because we're using the BPF programs to do the redirect, we have to do the normal, um, the fib lookup and the redirect ourselves. And um, just to complete all of the cases that we support in Cilium, if we're doing a, a tunnel mode, the fib lookup, MAC rewrite, and redirect at the end of that is actually a redirect to a tunnel. 
Okay, so that is the, that is the pod um, to the networking side. The other case that we have is the node to the, um, to a pod or a node to node or a node to host networking. And the difference here is that um, in the Kubernetes Cilium environment, um, we have BPF programs on the VEth devices attached for all the pods that are sending out their VEth. But if it's a host application, something running not in a pod, just on the host, we need to ensure that that's encrypted as well. And so normally this wouldn't actually pass through any Cilium BPF programs, but what we have done is we've added a route from host networking into the Cilium agent. So all of your traffic that you send on this host will then go to the Cilium agent. Once it's on the Cilium agent, we do the same sort of process that we've done before. We look up the key in the IP cache, we set the mark, we pass it back to the stack where it is encrypted once again, reroute it back to the Cilium agent, and then um, do this redirect thing again. And um, later we'll talk about pain points and, and you know, the reasons that we designed this versus maybe possibly some better implementations. Um, but what you can see is that we end up doing lots of routes and redirects through the stack here. And that's, that's because there's no native BPF to, to do encryption. Like you, you, you're forced, if you're trying to merge encryption and BPF, you have to pass things to the stack and then get them back. And this is an, another case, and we, we can just skip over that really quick. So that was, that's the basics of the L3 implementation. And then we'll talk about the L7 stuff here as well. Um, oh, this is even better. So we had three slides for IPsec. We get one slide for TLS. All right. <laughs> and TLS 1.3, because TLS 1.2 has too many arrows, right? Um, so the, the key, I think the key takeaway here is that um, nor the, the difference between TLS and MTLS is when you do normal TLS, you give your cert to the, um, let's see if I make sure I get this right. Um, you give your cert to the server, and then um, in, sorry, in mutual TLS, the, the server will request a cert from you, and you'll have to give, it, give the server the client cert, um, which doesn't happen in the normal TLS. So this is the normal flow. I'll just leave it up there. I don't think we need to walk through it specifically, but, um, the key, the key thing to note is that we're exchanging certificates. And then the other bit of technology we use is this KTLS soft map. And this, this really means that um, we can use, if we have an OpenSSL enabled application that has KTLS enabled, we then use the kernel's KTLS, which means that we can run uh, BPF inside the kernel on, on before it's encrypted. And then we can do a, um, possibly do like a, a redirect if needed. Um, and I'll talk about that specific case in just a moment. So the sort of standard way to do this in, in Cilium is to leverage STO and Envoy. Um, these are sort of two high level concepts uh, and uh, sort of architecture here that, um, that you can deploy alongside Cilium, and there's a, a bunch of how-tos to do this. And basically what happens then is Envoy, which is a sidecar proxy, so all the traffic that you send will go through Envoy, will then use the, the keys that are retrieved through this infrastructure and encrypt everything for you. Um, the traditional model to do this is to put Envoy in every pod. And what this means is that uh, anytime you send things out of a pod, you have to send it to the on Envoy first, and then Envoy will encrypt it and send it onto the network. Uh, the sort of uh, problem with deploying this is now you have an Envoy instance per pod. So if you go back to how we scale, you're thinking we have you know, 5,000 nodes, 100,000 pods, and now you have 100,000 instances of Envoy running in your network that all need to be managed and all need to do key exchanges and certificates and all this kind of stuff. So the first thing that Cilium has done is that it moves um, Envoy out of a per pod mode where it's running as a per pod sidecar and runs it in the, um, in the host. And instead of having um, every pod run the Envoy, it's running the host, and then via some policy in our BPF programs, we ensure that all of the packets pass through Envoy. And so now we've taken what was scaling at a per pod down to a per node, which can be quite significant when we're looking at 5,000 nodes. So what we've done here is we reduced um, sidecar from per pod to per node. So then the next, the next piece of a bit of acceleration that we provide, which is not specific to the encryption piece, but it is nice when you are doing encryption and every packet has to pass through Envoy, 
is we have um, the SOC map. What SOC map does is it uses the um, BPF SOC map hook, which intercepts every send, um, send message and will then do a copy into the receive buffer of Envoy. And the advantage here is you cut out two passes through the TCP stack to talk to a local socket. So we reduce lat latency. So that, those, are those, um, those are the supported L3 and L7 modes for Cilium. So what I want to talk about is sort of the pain points that we have from implementing um, these features. So everything before this is stuff that you can go and get from like a Cilium 1.6 release. Um, and what you may have noticed is I had to say like we routed through Cilium host and then we passed it up the stack and then we routed it back again uh, multiple times and there were some arrows that looked like circles, right? Okay, so this is sort of not ideal because we're going through the stack multiple times. It's also a bit fragile because you're inside the routing tables themselves and what you need to do is ensure that all your MTUs are correct. If you have a customer who has a route that happens to match a route that you have, you can end up with conflicts that you need to resolve um, and so on. So, so it works, um, but it's less than ideal. The second piece, um, which is uh, in the, all of the models that we've shown so far, the encryption was based off of the IP address only. So we look at the destination IP address and then we decide if we want to encrypt it or not. And this works because pods map fairly easily to, encrypt, to IP addresses, usually. But then we also have these things like services which have their own IP address that might have different backends. Um, and then we would also perhaps like to have even more fine-grained policy. Like say we only want to encrypt traffic if it's to this port. Because encryption is sort of expensive in software. Um, we may not want to actually encrypt all traffic on the node, but maybe a subset, all traffic to this service, all traffic to this port, uh, and so on. Right now, there's no way to do that with um, the IPsec stack. So it's, it's a bit limiting in, in that sense. Um, the other one is that it's always a bit tricky to decide if um, you can wildcard your source or your desk. So there, there's some other issues about um, uh, what's the quick way? There, there was uh, a few bugs that were reverted in the recent kernels about uh, what routing table actually gets used after you do IPsec. Um, and the bug was then fixed, so we're all good. But um, it also sort of showed the pain of not having a very specific uh, match criteria, you know, depending on what's programmed in the kernel. And this fits really nicely with BPF because this is a case where, well, we have some sort of unique requirements that maybe specific to a customer environment here or a customer environment there, and we want to write our own very specific um, encryption policy. So if we match these fields, go here. Um, so the question is how do we solve this? We have a few ideas, but they're, they're pretty high level at this point. Um, there's some idea to do a PPF encryption map. Um, basically, you could have a hash map with uh, the values being encryption state. You pass in a key, it looks up the state, and applies encryption. Um, Encryption can both be synchronous and asynchronous. So the synchronous case, this makes um, a lot of sense because you could just jump to the encryption and then come back to wherever you were in the BPF program. If it's asynchronous, now you have a slightly different problem because it's going to go away and at some point come back and tell you it's ready to, it's been encrypted. So um, some problems still there. But the, the goal is to both reduce complexity in the implementation, right? So we don't have all these routes in the routing table and we don't have a, a, a whole bunch of entries in the uh, IPsec encryption data path, but uh, also performance is another issue, right? So instead of passing multiple times to the stack, we will um, be able to, in theory, just do the lookup directly and then do the redirect without all the intervening routes and rule lookups. Um, the next one that is, is not clear is like there is offload for IPsec, um, but it, because of this sort of loop that we're doing through the routing tables, it's not a clear um, to me at least, how the offload bindings are supposed to handle this sort of case where we pass it from one VE to the next VE and then pick the, pick the destination um, device kind of later in the stack. Um, because we don't actually know when we're doing encryption where that destination um, interface will be. We don't know if it supports encryption and so on. But um, I think this would be a nice to have, um, sort of tightly integrated. So then the next one are, so what, are, what sort of pain points are we seeing on the L7 side? 
Um, to date, the L7 side on the KTLS and SOC map hooks only have um, uh, transmit. So we've been looking to do some receive side. So if your policy is that you want to, uh, you want to apply with KTLS encryption um, or all egress, um, everything is quite good. It works out well. But if you have ingress policies as well, then we have a, a missing piece there. And I think a couple of people have pinged me on the list and off list asking for this. So it seems important. Um, the other one we don't have yet is perfering support um, in KTLS, so it's hard to get events out of the KTLS BPF infrastructure if you want to know, um, you know statistics or um, you know, how often am I sending to this MTLS key or something It's missing. Um, the other one, and since there, I, there were some distribution talks earlier today, I think it was a good one to mention, the OpenSSL, we want to start being distributed with KTLS enabled. Um, so as soon as there's a release, it would be good to start seeing this more easily deployed. And um, if you happen to be an SSL library person, <laughs> not working on OpenSSL, we could use some help because we did um, some of the Mellanox folks did OpenSSL. It would be good to do some of the other other libraries as well, boring SSL, etc. All right. Um, there's a few points on the the key management. Um, so currently, like I said, we do a, a lot of people do the IPC, the, sorry, manage the secrets. Right now you have to manage it by um, manually updating the keys yourself. There's been a request to say, well, because you have the full um, insight into what the keys are doing, how the encryption is working, can't you also just, you know, give me a new key every so often to, to kind of make the story complete? Um, so that's sort of... Uh, not so much a kernel side pain point, but um, a request from the Cilium side, because I'm not sure we need much from the, the kernel to do that. Um, the other thing that, that I, I've sort of wondered is, right now we also keep a lot of the keys in the, um, this kind of user space visible key ring. So if you, if you query IPsec, and we had it on some of the um, earlier commands, the, the key itself is in the, in the output. You know, maybe we should put it in one of these kernel key rings so that it's locked down and like, just don't let um, users pull out the keys. Um, I did want to mention that for this most part, BPF has made um, sort of significant progress in the last year. So I think like a year ago, we might have said, well, we don't have these boxes checked. Um, but now I think BPF for the most part is, is doing what we need. And it's, it's sort of the other subsystems are pulling in these helpers to kind of complete the, the networking story. And um, with that, well, those were my slides. Are there any questions? Any Let's... questions, anyone? I'm not sure you mentioned, if you mentioned at the beginning, but why do you have two different ways to encrypt the traffic? And how do, like, when do you use one and when do you use the other? Right, so like, why do we have, for the layer three, for example, why do we have? Why do you have both IPsec and TLS? Oh, why do we have both IPsec and TLS? Yeah. Um, that, that's sort of more of uh, like a customer decision, what they would like to do. So TLS would be usually more L7-based encryption. Like uh, maybe you want to have a... Oh, so that's not encrypting all the traffic. Right, exactly. So then with L3, you might say, I want to encrypt everything on this node. Yeah. Okay. And I don't care if it's UDP or it's TDCP or some other protocol that I have no idea about. I want to ensure it gets encrypted. Okay, whereas... TLS is if they're running an application yeah. that uses TLS. Yeah. Okay. And the second question is, like, would you, are you considering using something like WireGuard for this one, so that lands? That comes up uh, a handful. You know, like usually when we, I've, we talk about this, um, we've talked about a few other places, people ask, you know, when is WireGuard coming? And um, I think it's just a feature request at this point. I think I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to nail down some of the pain points in this implementation first, right? Um, yeah, get this working well, and then, get rid of, no, yeah. and then yeah, um, exactly. I don't see any, like, there's no technical reason other than it just needs to be done, right? Yeah. And it needs to be upstreamed. Well, and, that, that is the main, I think, the main. <laughs> I realize that if, if they didn't use KTLS, the policy would have to be done externally with a separate key. Yeah. Like, you'd have to use a dummy key, then you can unencrypt it at the policy engine somewhere else, and then re-encrypt it with the real CA if you're going to GitHub or something like this. Whereas they do K KTLS, they're thinking they could do the policy, then KTLS and all locally by the app. Right. Uh, so you mentioned that the encryption process can be expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. There can be multiple periodic uh, health probes going from uh, node to pod. Uh, are those encrypted as well? 
or? Oh, yeah. So um, in the, when you have it enabled in the L3 mode, we will encrypt all node traffic. So like if you have just a normal, whatever, a health check message going from some node to some pod somewhere else, yeah, that'll get routed back to Cilium host, which is our sort of our, our main um, BPF program. And the BPF program will look it up in the, in the policy, and if the policy says all traffic from this node needs to be encrypted, it will um, apply the layer three encryption. Well, the help probes are just local traffic oh, going okay. from node kubelet so to pod. In, inside the system. Right. Yeah, so we don't currently encrypt local traffic. So the, the, the sort of thinking I have on this is that if, if a pod or even the node is sending traffic to another pod, um, I'm not entirely clear what advantage you get by encrypting it and then turning around and decrypting it. Right, so we, we basically look in the policy map and go, oh, that's a local pod. Let's just send it directly to the pod. Um, is that what you would expect? Do you have a preference? <laughs> Did no, you I want it to be encrypted? I would, uh, <laughs> I, I would have thought that you wouldn't encrypt the local traffic yeah. because it's right. just too much overhead. Yep. So how do you determine whether a destination pod is local? Do you read HCD state or? Um, so when, um, basically Cilium has this, um, list of all IPs inside uh, the network. So in the cluster, it'll know all the IPs. And what we've done is we've also added an IP to node mapping inside that map. So every IP maps back to a node. So inside BPF, what we do is we, we pull out the destination IP from the SKB, basically. And then we, we use that as a lookup key in the, with some extra metadata, but we use that as a lookup key in this map. And basically we get the node IP and we go, and then we know our local node IP, so we can go, does, does this match our local node IP? And if so, we just pass it along directly. Got it. And second question, when you move Envoy to, at the load level, yes. uh, how does distributed tracing continue to work? Good question. Um, is the concern that in the, when you're doing the distributed tracing, you also have the pod info, is that, what you're right, the envoy uh, as a sidecar uh, right. inserts some metadata right. in HTTP headers like request ID and such. So. Yeah, um, I th believe that we pass some IDs through the mark value, and then those get get used to um, kind of map the pod to to the envoy. In this sense, I'm not sure if it's one to one. To be honest, I didn't actually do the envoy implementation myself, so the the envoy developer is unfortunately not here, but. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure if it's one-to-one. -one. There, there's some mapping. I'm not sure exactly how it works. Hey, John. Hey. Um, so I think if I understood you correctly, you're, you're saying that your, your IPsec tunnel is managed on a per-node basis? Yes. So, a, or a tenant's pods are typically distributed across multiple nodes and often mm -hmm. connected with VX lands. How do you manage those tunnels if you have multiple virtual tunnel endpoints? Yeah. Okay. So inside the this map that has the destination IP, we also have an ID of the tunnel that that it should use for VX land tunnel. So you actually have an IPsec tunnel per virtual tunnel connection. Yes. Well, well you could do that. You would probably. There's a question about how useful it is to have a VXLAN tunnel inside an IPsec tunnel. Right, that's, that, that's the, sort of the implication yeah, there. Yeah. Um, that is possible via configuration to make happen. Like we don't block this from, from, from happening. I've not seen anybody actually try to deploy that. Right? Okay. How would you normally do it? So, so normally you could either do um, IPsec without tunnel mode, so just do the transport mode, and then you have the IPsec, um, so then you have the VXLAN, and then you have IPsec again, but not the tunnel mode, so it's just. Just in transport mode, so yeah. you don't add the extra header. Yeah, so that would be one way. Um, the other way, which is, it takes more work because it has to change your sort of network a little bit, but um, you c one thing that happens when you use IP and IP tunnel mode is now you have an IP per, um, per node, so you could use that as your tunnel, but then, you lose some of the, the VXLAN 
tenant ID okay. and stuff like that, right? But either way, you've got a, a basically a key pair per VTAP. Yeah, okay. exactly. Thanks. Anyone else have a question? Anyone else? All right. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, thank you.